Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, today, we have Adam Toe, and he is here to talk about Mix Effect Pro. We're very excited to have him back. Uh, there's been some updates, and he's going to give us, he's going to show us through the updates a little bit and then answer your questions. So stay tuned for that. And let's, uh, and a reminder that uh, Ken Jordan will be here the in after hours the right after the show to talk about web development and he's doing a great series on that so uh, so come and join us uh, right after the show uh, in after hours all right let's go ahead and jump into the questions uh, bill what do we have our first one from courtney gooden is actually for me he says can bill davis report back on his experience at comic-con this weekend and bill what do you got and I'm happy to do that. So I've been going to Comic-Con for a number of years. Uh, one of my family members got me involved with it because he was an amateur cartoonist in his young days. And so he's been going since it was a small little thing, just celebrating the people who actually drew the comics. It was very small. It has grown into a monster. So let me switch over and I'll show you some of my photos from this year. Uh, Let's see. I, my theme this year was back in real life. Uh, for those of you who don't know, San Diego has a beautiful convention center, and we are looking uh, from the convention center parking garage across, and you can see that there's tons of money spent on this. Look at the building wraps. In fact, I have a closer one. The major motion pictures and studios really take over the entirety of downtown San Diego for this event and wrap things and make this huge. And one of the nice things about this is that San Diego really supports this. The gas lamp district is across from the convention center, which you see here on the left. All of what you just saw is on the right side of this across the street. This was the COVID check-in line. They were very serious about doing COVID mask checks and everything. This is the convention center from across the street. So it's a beautiful piece of architecture. They've run a really nice job. So I thought I'd give you a little look through the gas lamp first, which is the district across the street. So crowds of people wandering through. And on the right, you will see that one of the first things you would see if you took the main thing is a Game of Thrones standalone. They build these magnificent little kind of pop-up experiences for people to go through. So there would have been lines to get into this. We're now going to go down the promenade. The first thing I ran into as I was walking down the little side street is sandcastles uh, in favor of Audible. Audible put up a thing and did these magnificent sandcastle sculptures. This is a promotional thing for the Gray Man movie that's coming out. And this is almost a block in size, just this one promo for the movie. And in fact, in there, you can run the obstacle course and pretend you're the secret agent and they have sky cams filming you and they create a, a piece for you uh, that you can download afterwards. In fact, everywhere you look, and we're just walking around now the streets adjacent to Comic-Con. They've set this up so that you don't have to have a ticket for the actual con. There's lots to do. You'll see a line and the next thing you know, what is this? Well, for the Dungeons and Dragons folks, they have set up bars and things like that. And there's all sorts of lines that you find that just lead you to things in the community as the community is full of people attending Comic-Con. So very much a family event, crazy cosplay on the streets that has nothing to do with getting a ticket and going into the show. A lot of media production is being done around the con. Uh, this was interesting to me. ABC have a show called Abbott uh, Elementary, I guess. I'd never heard of it, but they literally built their set on the grounds of Comic-Con. This is at the Marriott Hotel across from it. And literally you can come in and sit at the desk where the teacher on the show would set or the principal would set. Uh, this is down, uh, we're adjacent to the water in Mission Bay. So this is just one of the lines of people waiting to get into something at Comic-Con because this is probably a three quarter mile or, or half a mile long line. This might be for one of the bigger uh, places. It's also next to the ocean, so people pull up with yachts. As a matter of fact, famously, the one with the yellow umbrellas there is the IMDB yacht, and they host parties all week long for that. There's a close-up of the IMDB boat. Uh, this is just being towed through the harbor as you're there, and you can get a sense of the scale because that's an actual human being on the right side of that picture. These things just surround the event. So, again, another wide shot of there. Let's get into the Comic-Con actual hall. On the left is your walk-up area. Uh, on the right, some we've taken a first step in. It's a beautiful architectural building, which is great for photographers because, you know, you want to see things. Here's the show floor. This is, a, this is view to the right, view to the center, and view to the left. So you can see it is a very, very, very big convention. There's just so much going on there. It's kind of like brain overload. This is a big, typical Marvel thing when they're doing some product giveaways. Uh, they also have 
on the second floor of the convention center, massive rooms where they're doing uh, in-person panels. So there's literally maybe 60 to 100 of these going on concurrently every cycle. So uh, there'll be 100 for the an hour and a half, and then another 100 happen later. It's a huge thing. So let's get to the thing that people come to Comic-Con for, which is cosplay. This was outside the convention center. I just thought it was kind of interesting because I saw this guy getting in costume. So you can see in the upper left him starting to suit up and then... Uh, that's the end result. That's just one of the kind of more commercial looking cosplay things. So every year I try to do portraiture and these are kind of typical. This was Thursday, first day. These are just kind of amateur having fun cosplayers. And because masks were so integrated this year, people were integrating masks into their costumes. So I actually thought I was going to do a whole series on just people's eyes because it was, I couldn't see anything else. But then I realized that we were going to have more of the kind of cosplay I'm used to uh, that I thought this was an interesting, some really artistic person integrating their mask into their costume and making it a part of it. Then I started to find a theme for this year and um, Catwoman outside there was one of the pieces, but you can see the extent some people go into to do cosplay. And this is where I start to have fun just as a photographer trying to make photos rather than just taking photos. And I ran across him from Sandman outside and just had, I, for me, this is fun because I get to try out new photo things that I had done. I did a sky replacement on him and it seemed kind of work for me. And you can see the level of building wrap and the environment you get both inside and outside. Um, this year, it turned out my last day, my theme was more anime because we had so many people doing really superb anime cosplay. And that's why I really kind of felt like I hit my stride as a photographer this year. Uh, that was just a young lady I ran into at the top. She and her partner and her partner actually is my favorite cosplay photo of this year. That's the one that I think I'm going to use as the end of uh, my uh, Comic-Con 2022 experience. So that gives you just a little overview of all the stuff going on at San Diego for Comic-Con. It is a big deal. It's been going on for decades, and it's just a lot of fun. That was really good. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Thanks. Great, great work. Great work, Bill. Um, you know, I, I think that there is a, I think that watching that, what, what I was left with was there's another level of conference coverage, which is just a photo shoot of the conference. Like it's something we're not going to send a bunch of crew to. We're not going to uh, try to cover with video or live, but some people go and take a bunch of photos that are really good that really describe the show. Um, I think that could be another interesting way to, to cover that, but uh, so that was a lot of I kind of think the actual Comic Con is so big, it's almost uncoverable because there's literally every time I go, I run my tail off for two or three three or four days. And I feel like I've covered 1% of it. Yeah. The only time I've ever been there, I've worked there. So I, I, I just know one little window, like it'll always be like, there's this one corner of something that I, that I know a lot about, but I've, I've actually never been in the expo. Like I, I realize I've never walked into the expo at all because I'm always working at some, and usually it's not even on site, you know, it's somewhere in one of the venues around it or something like that. It's just really interesting. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, good job, Bill. And if you need a place to practice, check out any Walmart. It's pretty much the same. <laughs> All right, next question. Next question comes to us from Chris Fenwick in Emeryville, California. He says, in a remote show, when the director or producer has their Unity comms gain way too high, what is your go-to method to get them to realize they're hurting everyone's ears? Uh, I, th there's a couple things. One is I believe that we can, and I, I, we don't have to do that as much anymore, but, um, you can, um, bring it down a little bit in the mix. So the way, the way ours work, cause they're going into hardware, um, headsets a lot of times. Um, but otherwise it'd be telling people sometimes that they need to turn it down. <laughs> you know, like, Hey, you got your mic a little hot. And usually it's, 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 it's a, uh, and we're moving through. Okay. I'm sorry. Our questions are going everywhere. Um, uh, but, but asking people to, to bring it down and, and just the key, the key with anytime you're going to ask someone, uh, what their, if they can make an adjustment, especially if it might be a client or another one is just try to be as low key as possible and as precise as possible. So, you know, it's just, Hey, I think that you might, you, you and it's, it's, again, it's not what you want to try to not be is hyper hyperbolic about it. You know, like, Oh, you're blowing my ears out or blah, blah, blah. blah. People do that. <laughs> like they just like, they'll just, they'll just, oh, oh my God, you know, and that's unprofessional. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so the, the answer is really a, you know, 
Hey, you know, hey, Chris, um, you're uh, you're coming in. You might be coming in a little bit hot. Um, if you go into your window and go about halfway down, you're going to see a little slider there. Can you just move that a little bit to the, you know, like, but that's kind of the, you just want to keep it, you know, low key. And if you can try to do that as a direct. So you go direct to the person. You don't do it over the PL. So you go to the direct of the person and you go, hi, Chris. Uh, I, you know, I, I, it's, uh, I'm just picking on Chris because thank you. What's my question? Uh, I don't know. Oh, it was your question. There you go. Um, I, I just made, I just, so I just picked you randomly. Uh, Mitchell. Yeah, I agree uh, with Alex. I think uh, using your airline pilot voice uh, seems to work wonders. And as gregarious as I can be, I don't jump up and down and pull my earphones mm -hmm. off and it just doesn't help the anything. You want to keep a professional. We, we like to think about the NASA voice because the airline voice, would be, you know, that, that would be, I mean, that's pretty much NASA. You can't airline. You can't understand anything they're saying, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, the, the real the real issue is that it's a when it's like the director or the producer, yeah, whoever the main voice is, they think that they um, you know, well, well, I should be loud. You should be able to hear me. I was like, well, there's a difference between loud and distorted, and and that's really what the thing is. So I'm. I have to make a confession, Alex. I'm sort of monitoring a live show that's going on right now yeah. on Unity, and. Uh, uh, I don't have to talk on the show and I don't even have to listen the whole time. But uh, this morning, the producer was maybe like literally double what everybody else was. And it becomes a huge detriment because people will turn down. It, yeah. Not that that's going to affect her distortion. She's distorting on the head end. You know, her gain stage is all off. But um, people will turn down for that and then they'll miss all the other cues because they're trying to compensate for that one person that's super loud so i mean i just go back to like literally we could do gain stage week on office hours because it's such an important part of what we do and and what's interesting is that that's something that we kind of gave up with all these virtual events and and because with you know with um events that, that we work on there's a technician that comes over when you talk too much you go oh we're going to work on this a little bit and they just turn down the the overall gain of your, of your entire headset um to to make to adjust for you good sky well, I remember sitting in a trailer in a desert with Chris Fenwick and his enthusiasm was something that we had not been able to rehearse. So I'm getting to the point of rehearsal. And as the TD, I was able to gently, you know, touch his arm, but it was, we were launching a rocket. There were was multiple a, taps on the shoulder. <laughs> multiple taps. Calm down. Calm down. It was there very entertaining. Go. But yeah, but but gently, I think is the is the best word <laughs> to give input. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. Bo says, "Last weekend, an electrical storm fried my cable modem, which apparently then fried both WAN ports of my USG Pro router. What good is a router with redundant WANs if a modem can knock the whole thing out?" Go ahead, Courtney. Well, lightning management is a thing in areas. We don't have this problem in Los Angeles because we only have lightning about once every 15 years. But um, <clears throat> if, uh, if a good cable installer, this is something you need to worry about. If you have um, <clears throat> coaxial cable coming into your house and your modem is hooked up to a cable modem, is make sure the cable installer, when he brings the cable into your house, drives a, a grounding rod into the ground. It used to be easy because they used to have galvanized water pipes on all homes installations that ran into the ground or into the, uh, at least into the foundation of the home and you just tie stuff to that steel pipe that ran down for a gas line or water line. But these days with all the uh, plastic uh, PVC and, and plastic piping for gas lines, those don't exist much anymore, so make sure they drive like a six six foot uh, piece of copper or steel into the ground and tie the shield into to the ground onto that ground of your incoming cable to serve as a lightning arrester, and that hopefully will shunt enough current into the ground before it gets to your cable modem. Uh, otherwise, all bets are off. Electricity finds a way. <laughs> Good, Jeff Goldblum says. <laughs> Good, Jason. Well, the benefit is that there are more things than lightning that can bring down the internet. Um, the internet sometimes just brings itself down spontaneously. So having that redundancy is uh, serves more than one purpose. More importantly, I'll remind you that you can pretty quickly with the SFP plus ports, just kind of get a quick converger, converter in there that 
um, eliminates the copper entirely, and, and that will pretty much fix the issue. Yeah, the um, the I mean, the primary use for WAN ports for us is two different WANs. So, you know, two different WANs that they're going to be connected, not necessarily connected to the same modem. Um, so in that case, I think you probably would have had a chance, at least, that it wouldn't have, have arrested the whole thing. Now, there's also... Um, UP, a lot of UPSs have, um, you know, it, it just depends on what you're putting in there, but they ha you can pass the, uh, the internet through those UPSs. Now, I don't do that because I don't trust the electronics in a UPS to manage what I need for, for internet connection. So, so I don't do that, but they are available. Like, so if you want to put them in there and then uh, for anything that, that we have that's like that, that is mission critical, um, usually we have a, another just another one, another piece of hardware that we have there just in case them something gets uh, fried. We've seen a lot of things get fried for a lot of reasons, um, and Lightning is just one of them. Go ahead, Kai. Yeah, I'd be looking also at a power conditioner. So folks like Furman will have, um, oops, not that. Um, you'll have a, just a device in front that can take that hit ahead of time. And so it's it's cleaning up the power. Not it, It's not... A UPS backup. So you have two different things going on. So for here at my place, I have a power conditioner in front of my UPS. So that way, if there is a lightning strike, the U the power conditioner takes the hit and the UPS is a secondary, but it's not primary, you know. It, and does so the Furman do pass the ethernet through it as well? Because that's the, that's the big thing that happened here is it came up the ethernet cable. Oh. Yeah. Wow. It, it like, I've yeah. never it, seen a Furman do that. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's what I was saying that there's the, the, some of the UPSs that we have have Ethernet in, Ethernet out that you can push in there and that they'll clip it there. You know, they'll clip it on a strike. Um, but yeah, in, you know, I have been in situations where we, we have lightning and um, unless we have to operate during that lightning storm, we tend to unplug things just because we're just, we just, the, the air is the, is the best uh, uh, insulator for, for that, for that type of thing. Uh, next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina, up next with what importance or value do industry awards have in your career? I know of Courtney's shiny Emmy. Are there any other major awards we can brag about within this community? Go ahead, Sky. Well, I'd like to thank the Academy, but they did not give me this one. This was, uh, again, an award from the theater company I was a part of, and it was very special to me because it acknowledged to my peers uh, an accomplishment in a specific category. So I've been a part of industries that give out awards. And again, it is an acknowledgement of your peers. It is also, as the word you put in your question, it's a shiny thing. So I know once upon a time at an agency, the young execs were trying to do something very courageous. And, and all of the, the senior exec said, we better get a lot of awards for this because we're not getting paid. <laughs> so they use it as as marketing capital of people that used to be the barrier to entry was the equipment. You didn't understand how to make all of this video production. But now that everybody's on camera all the time, uh, I'm, I'm curious about if the awards are as shiny as they used to be as far as attracting, you know, potential customers. Go ahead, Mitchell. I think most of us in the business know which ones are a scam because they're ones uh, – that you can buy your way into just by entering with a fee and then you get the statue with the wings on it and stuff. But, you know, a Clio, an Emmy, an Academy Award, a Tony, uh, whatever, um, like, uh, like Sky says, you know, you want, you want the recognition of your peers because mm -hmm. like, it makes you feel good and it also brings in business. Good, Courtney. And those Lifetime Achievement Awards are, are nice because you couldn't win it any other way other than outliving everybody else. Um, <laughs> and when you get to be my age, you know, I've, I've got a plaque on the wall over there, too, uh, for a life member of SMPTE. After 50 years, they give you one of those. Uh, so if you just outlive a lot of other people, they will give you a plaque and sometimes a reduction of your dues. The trick <laughs> is you have to remember what you were up there for. Yeah. I, uh, I think I got a Dakota ring when I was 10. I think that's my last, uh, my last big prize. Uh, next question. This one comes from Frozen Banwell in San Diego here in California. Imagine Dragons as a VIP with private viewing platform, interactive activities, brand new immersive experiences in Mercury Lounge, San Diego, Chula Vista, from $40 on the lawn to over $1,100. Has anybody been able to expand on Live Nation's immersive experiences? Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. I was just going to say, I used to be a music director at a big radio station, and 
Um, I got really spoiled very quickly because I wanted to be backstage or in the super box to see it and enjoy the, uh, the event today. Um, we have a big one here in Delaware called Firefly. And, um, yes, it's exactly the way you explain it there. You can spend $2,000 and get a uh, super box up off the stage. And that was worth it for Paul McCartney, you know, because you get a chance to meet and greet and do all that kind of stuff. But, um, for the most part, uh, I can't go into the crowds anymore. It's just too much. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, that, you know, I'm sad at the state of ticketing for concerts and things like that. Because I remember in, when I was growing up, you could get in to see big acts and it was 40 or 45 bucks. And that was a stretch for us while I was in college and things like that. That uh, the ticketing has gone nuts in some. And to the point where I remember I, I flew over to uh, Los Angeles to see a little show. There was a, a band with a mandolin player, Chris Thiele, who was, I thought, a genius. And I'd heard about him. So I thought, I've got some points on my credit card. I'm going to go over and go over to do it. And for the first hour, I sat in my little corner of the balcony seat. I watched everybody come in except for the first third of the floor. And I realized that the first full third of the floor was all being held back by the promoter for friends and people who couldn't get, you know, you can't buy a ticket there. You have to be in the system to be able to get one of those primary positions to watch the band play. And as I've seen this happen more and more to where if you really want a good seat for something, it's sometimes thousands of dollars. I, I'm sad. I know it's a business and I know that. But between ticket brokers and the rest of this, I'm I'm kind of following Mitch's thing. I just don't want to go because I know I'm going to spend a lot and I'm going to have a very medium experience because all the premium experiences are sequestered for people who have more clout or more money or the right credit card or something. Sad. Yeah, as, uh, as Mitch was, I was also a music director and... Those first three rows were the only place I saw a show for a couple of years. <laughs> so, so it was, uh, you know, like that's all I, that's all, that's the only place I knew how to see a show. And, um, you know, what I, one of the things I noticed, <clears throat> and I think that they're trying to figure this out is that, you know, as Mitch was talking about, I was very spoiled, you know, like I just got used to, you know, every show was about backstage, you'd have drinks with the band, you'd, you'd, um, you know, talk about things. I mean, if it was a bigger, bigger artist, you would just get to shake their hand, but it was still, you know, it was like sting, <laughs> you know, so you get to <laughs> shake his hand, <laughs> then sit in the third row or whatever and watch the show. And uh, what's interesting is that I found out later, the artists hate that because the folks sitting in the front, and I was probably as much as anyone, is a little jaded and they don't, they're not really into the show at the same level, um, you know, that, that a lot of folks are because they, um, because they see these all the time. I mean, I was out, I, I saw oftentimes two or three shows in a night because I would only see pieces of them. Like I would literally go and watch them for a little while and then I go to another, I had backstage and something else at some other show and then I went to another one and then it was just kind of like that all the time. And so you just didn't, you didn't really think about it. But what I did notice was that I, um, I got very used to, I really liked, I figured out that I really liked 300 seat venues. Um, up to 700 was okay. And anything bigger than that, I won't go anymore. <laughs> like, like I just, you know, cause it just, it was just like this big wash of whatever. And I didn't, it was too chaotic and it was too whatever. And so I really learned that three to th three to 700, less than that, you know, it was really cool and we got to see them, but it didn't really make sense in any way, shape or form for, for that kind of thing. But about 300, if people were really into it, you could really feel it. And, uh, it got, didn't get better after that. It started just going downhill and, um, and then, uh, then at about 700 was my cutoff. And then that was like anything more than that was too much. And, um, I remember seeing a YouTube, uh, show where I, you know, someone gave us tickets at Lucasfilm or whatever. And we went and saw them at the Coliseum or the cow palace or the Coliseum or something. And, and, um, I sat, I was way in the back and wet and I was like, why would anyone do this? <laughs> you know, like, like, why would you ever pay money to sit way back here and look at a jumbotron, which was small as well? Like, like for you, you know, you're so far away. And, um, and so I think that there is going to be a, a shift in that. Now, a lot of us that work in live events are trying to figure out how to um, benefit the folks that are willing to pay a little bit more for that extra experience. I mean, there are, you know, there's a subset of almost every fan that is willing to, that wants the opportunity to pay more. Like, I mean, that's the crazy thing. They want to be able to buy their way into a better experience. They don't want every seat to be $40 each, you know, like they, and they, and so it's, it's, you're not, 
you're, you're giving them the opportunity. Like we can, we have limited resources. We can only give this to a certain number of people. But if you look at something like a bottle rock or a Coachella or what a bottle rock is like, bottle rock is very <laughs> old person's Coachella, you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, it's in Napa and it's very <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's very, yeah, like a lot of wine. <laughs> and, um, anyway, so, uh, but there's lots of these VIP things more than almost anywhere else because there's lots of people there with a lot of money and they just want to go, oh, I just want to be backstage. I did look at this one specifically, this VIP one. It's not just in San Diego. It's everywhere. I mean, it's in the tour and um, they're giving away a guitar, like a guitar. And the ticket was like four ninety five. I was like, how do you give away a guitar? I mean, it can't be a very good guitar if you're giving away the, the guitar with the ticket. But but they are. They, they said, we'll send you a guitar, like it's a special, some kind of special guitar, which I'm sure, again, I can't imagine it would be very good if it came with the ticket. But, um, but anyway, but they, you know, the big thing is with these, what makes them work is if you can work out enough deals with enough fo folks, you know, there's this thing where you're matching up values where there's some companies that want exposure. There's some companies that want this. And so if you can build a swag bag for someone that the individual parts are worth way more than they paid for the ticket, then it's really exciting for them to do. But, I, but I think that there, um, you know, I think you'll see more. I mean, I've, I've worked on these kind of campaigns for 30 years and it definitely works. And it's definitely a service to people who, you know, want to, want to have, are really into it sometimes it's not that they have a lot of money either. It's that they saved up a lot of money so they could get that experience. You know, you have to remember, it's not just for rich people. I mean, I, we had a babysitter that was really into Taylor Swift and, um, and, uh, she only, the only reason she bothered, you know, she didn't need to babysit. She babysits. So she has tickets. She has money to buy all the tickets for every show in California, which her parents, if she bought the tickets, her parents would take her. Um, but, but she was, and she was very excited. I gave her a, a pick that Taylor Swift gave or Taylor Swift's dad gave me, so that was, we, we, we became the coolest uh, family that she, that she uh, babysat for. <laughs> Go ahead, Nigel. So we may be contrary to everybody else here. Two quick thoughts. One, um, we wanted to go and see The Who mm. live, just to say we'd seen The Who live, but we didn't want to pay $12,000 for a ticket in the front three rows, so we got a ticket in all but the back row. And you know what? We saw The Who live, and it got out faster than the people in the front row at the end of it. And that ticked the experience. So there's some benefit sometimes in the mm -hmm. back. But my main thought was, um, I used to be on the board of a theatre company, and we had famous people come through, do meet and greets. And let me tell you, though, one very famous person stood in the corner and waited for people to go to them. Martin Short walked around the room and said, hello, I'm Martin Short. Who are you? Tell me about you. Let me tell you that what I think about Martin Short reflects that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that just a one side note is when we met Sting, Sting was 100% focused on you for about a minute, you know, like, and then he would be off to someone else. But it was not like he was somewhere else. He was listening to exactly what you were talking about. He was talking to you about it. He was 100% there. You Like you had his world for one minute. And then his manager would just pull him on to the next person and he'd go, whoop, and you just disappear. <laughs> like, you know, like, and that was it. But it was an amazing, it was, I've been backstage a lot. And he was one of the more amazing ones to see backstage, even though I only got to spend a minute there. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, he owes you a lot considering all the money he's making off all the copies of every breath you take you've bought over the years. Um, you know, <laughs> the, the thing about big shows, and I've said this before, is that, yeah, they become less personal and not as good. But if you insist on going to a big show, you may take the gamble of waiting until the concert starts and then walking up to the ticket counter and saying, I'd like to buy a ticket to the show. You may not get in. I'm going to tell you flat out. But what happens is when the shows start, the, every artist is given amazing tickets in the front row. Like or first couple rows, like um, and they're designed to give to their friends and family and business associates, but quite often they don't give them away. And when the show starts, they go on sale. And I saw a Sting in like the fourth row at the Shoreline Amphitheater for face value. You know, there were there were people that had spent hundreds of dollars to get tickets. I paid like thirty five bucks. Right, right, yeah, it was great. now they're just trying to clear them. Right, yeah. they just want to, it's like, well, let's get a little money out of these. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. 
Frojan, I just am interested, you know, I don't know what the whole package is, but I'm interested in how they're doing it. So if you do decide to do this, please pop back and let us know uh, in a question or something like that exactly what this interactive experience is. What's it like? Are they, you know, is in each of these venues as they set it up? I doubt it's very good. Like, like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, 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 like when they, when they don't show you pictures of it or they don't do whatever interactive experiences, you know, there's some janky little, I but mean, like it's just activities. Yeah. What are they doing? What mm-hmm. are they trying? That's all mm-hmm. that would interest me about this is just a yeah. description of what, it, what they think this means in this era. Big yeah. band. Yeah. Go ahead, Jason. Having spent a decade on stage as the guy taking pictures of of the talent, um, I, I've got to say your um, experience tracks pretty well with mine, Alex. Um, I, I remember seeing Above and Beyond, and their trick was, you know, they they have this push the button thing, and you know they pick someone from the audience, and they the person comes up on the stage, and by the time they're on the stage, they're just shaking because they're so excited. Um, just to, to push a button to start a track. Um, Armin Van Buren had something similar. BT took an hour for um, selfies, you know. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I think that that show alone was probably the best engagement I've ever mm-hmm. seen from anyone, you know, and any tour manager coming up with any gimmick that um, that they're you know that they could come yeah, up with. We're a little off subject, but you know, Peter Gabriel does a pretty good job. You know, he, cause he puts the set, he, a lot of time, a lot of his stuff is center staged. So it's centered. So everyone feels like they're a lot closer and you all feel like you're in this party and he's going around on bicycles and, and, and call all kinds of stuff. Like he takes it to an entirely different, if you ever see a Peter that if he tours again, I don't know if he's going to tour again, but if he ever tours again, it's a, uh, it's an event. <laughs> it's like, don't, don't worry about that. You know, like it's, it's music, but it's like, you know, that he's spent an enormous amount of time thinking about it and he's got a thousand crazy ideas and he's going to do all of them, you know, like, like, you know, like he's just, and, and he takes the, he takes the, I think that for all the concerts I've seen, he, he's the crazy, it's just the craziest concepts. Then you're like, who was on drugs when they designed this? <laughs> because it's just like these incredibly luscious, whatever. And then it'll stop and be something that is, um, what did he do? He had one where the, the, all of the, um, Oh, uh, mercy. He's saying mercy in a circle. So these people come out and sing, you know, this, this, I mean, so, so you've got all this craziness and he had, and it's all this insanity and then it stops and he brings out this choir and they sing it together and you're just like, wow. You know, so his, it's not just that he does crazy things. It's because a lot of bands do crazy things. It's that his understanding of the, you know, the pentameter of the thing where I'm going to do something crazy and then I'm going to stop and I'm going to do something crazy and then I'm going to stop. It's, it's just really well done. Like, um, let's go to the next question. Next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul says, what happens when you archive a Matterport scan? Do you lose anything? Is it recoverable? You do it, guy. Yeah, you can move them in and out of an archive to active uh, at any time. You don't lose anything except for the ability to uh, well, you don't lose anything permanently, but if you move an active space to an archive, you won't be able to view it if it's published somewhere. So if you embedded it on a website or something like that, it'll no longer be viewable. Uh, but if you want to take like measurements or something like that, you do me- need to move it from the archive space to the active space to be able to take those mem- uh, measurements as well as just to do any kind of uh, tweaks to it. If you want to add some labels or or um, do any kind of other, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, where you touch out like objects, like some people like to blur uh, license plates and things like that. So you can't do any of that when you're in an archive state. You have to be in an active state. And the free plan only has two. So I understand why, why the question, because I'm about ready to move over to the other paid plan, because uh, you do get some cool things like the ability to, to publish to um, like Google My Business, which is how we're going to use it. So we can scan our, our showroom and let people virtually go in. But it's really cool for 79 bucks. Uh, I'm, it's right over my shoulder right there. You can... You can see it hooked up to the iPhone. It's pretty amazing. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm not that sure how how it how it works as far as archiving goes. This is what it looks like uh, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, this is the uh, um, uh, cloister. What is this? The I can't remember the um, cloisters or something. But you can see as you move uh, through, there are some uh, holes. And if you stay, uh, it depends on the, the lens that you choose. If you full go wide out, it, you'll see some artifacts appear in the transitions as it tries to do a smooth 
transition across the 3D objects. So it combines the, the 360 degree views with the uh, LiDAR scans so that you can see the objects uh, from a number of angles and it tries to paste them together. But it, it gets a little dicey every now and then <clears throat> with the, probably when they do the point cloud reduction uh, to, to get all that uh, 3D data from the scan into, uh, into a model that they can paste the imagery on. Uh, it, by, it naturally reduces the data quite a bit, so you, you lose some in the capture process, but probably not in the archive, since most of that uh, data reduction has already happened before you get into uh, uh, making it active. Next question. Next one comes to us from Paul Wallace again in Austin, Texas. I need a low-cost hot swap four drive array. What enclosure should he look at? What two terabyte and four terabyte hard drives are reliable? And he notes uh, Synology or something else. I go ahead, Tom. Yeah, the correct answer is Synology. They do have an older uh, DS920 plus. It's a four bay. Uh, I use that for my Plex server, have for a couple of years, really a solid device. But the new hot ticket is the DS1522+. Plus. That's been introduced just this month. It's uh, empty, no drives, $700, but it has four gigabyte or four one gigabyte Ethernet ports on the back for link aggregation. You can add a 10 gigabit Ethernet to it and Probably the biggest thing about Synology is their 24 by 7 by 365 support line. These people answer the phone. They answer your question. They're really great. For drives, I'd use the Western Digital Red drives. I like them. I just bought two of these 1522 pluses in the last two weeks and just moved 30 terabytes of data in the last week. Go ahead, Mitchell. I, uh, let's come down in price a little bit. Uh, OWC has a full line of different drives for raids. Um, what, is, what does Mickey call the zero raids? He calls them danger uh, raids. Risky and, raid. Um, we yeah, call, risky raid. We, we, we used to call them when, when, in, in ours, we call them scary raids. Scary raids. Yeah, scary raids. It was a funny uh, term. But anyhow, they've got a lot of different options there, especially in different price ranges. Uh, go ahead, Jason. Um. I love OWC, and I recommend just about everything that they do. In this case, Synology 5-Bay. I'm sorry, the DS1522 is absolutely the winner here. Um, if you want to have really good, reliable storage, though, put a pair of MSATA OWC SSDs in there, and then you can't go wrong. Uh, next, uh, next question. Uh, next one comes to us from Jen Zolson in Sandpoint, Idaho, and he says, what sound treatments have people used that pass the wife test? I don't think I can pull off a blanket for <laughs> not in the dining room. Come on. Go ahead, Nigel. Yeah, I've just put the wave panels up on a couple of the walls you can't see in my office, and uh, my wife helped me put them up, and they look, they look pretty good. So, um, you know, the one behind me is done. Uh, for uh, reasons of uh, commercial reasons, but the ones either side of me now are those, and, and Laurie like those. Go ahead, Mitchell. I'm not married, so I don't know how to do the wife test. However, um, I would love to have anybody that uh, was considering themselves a candidate come by and see how wonderful my soundproofing is, and I make a great uh, candidate. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. I've been failing the wife test for years in this thing, which too much commercial stuff. But I will note that there are companies now that produce sound absorbing panels that are specifically for that. And you can get art screened on them. So that's an easy way to get around the uh, wife test. I, you know, I mm -hmm. remember seeing a nice looking studio that had jazz instrument extreme close ups on it. They were functional sound panels, but they looked very, very nice. So look around. You'll be able to find some things like that that should pass the wife test. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. You can hang tapestries. Um, you could hang anything else that might be a little too thin and put some foam behind it. A lot of times people will take uh, acoustic foam or whatever, and they'll build a frame around it, stretch some fabric over it. Um, you really just want something that doesn't reflect. You know, just think of it. Think of it that way. It doesn't have to be, you know the uh, garage band, you know, a million egg crates that you stole from the grocery store kind of thing. It, did, you know, it can door. look nice. A door. A door works well. Uh, next question. 
JHB in New York up next. When the, pan when the panelists are traveling, do they find a need for a VPN? And if so, which is the best? Thanks. Go ahead, John. I don't know which one is the best. For years, I used a product called Hide My Ass. That's the name of the product. Clean show, I know. Uh, but it was a great product until recently. I switched over to Proton, the same guys that make Proton Mail. I've been I'm using Proton, Proton, and it's been solid. They have like 1,700 servers around the world. Yeah, and, and uh, of course, we, we kind of have the, the big version of it. We use Meraki's for those kinds of things. And so what's nice about that is that we have a Meraki, you know, head station or, or central station in, in uh in our office and it means that if we if we need to we can throw hardware out there and now we have a switch that is managed and we'll put everything that we plug into it all of our devices and everything else into that vpn um and if we need to though you can vpn in via um just the vpn from the from the laptop as well um and it also has things like mdm and all kinds of other fun stuff and that good guy yeah for traveling i've been using the ipad pro with cellular that way i don't have to use somebody else's internet and then i use the brave vpn and it just kicks on it's 99 bucks a year but uh i like to use the paid services i've just had bad experiences with ones that are free so just be aware of your something's free it may be too good to be true yeah jason mozilla's vpn is also brand new and and quite good next question Next one comes from the Seventh Scroll in Brooklyn. Morning, guys. They say thoughts on the Kia instrument, and there's a link there. Uh, go ahead, John. If you dig, you can find the actual application, desktop app, both Windows and Mac. It's it's fun. To, I'm not a player, so it comes up as a synth, software based synth, and then push push the buttons. They've got a huge list of drop down of sample uh, noises in there that you can fool around with. It's kind of kind of crazy. It's it's a neat product. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I just I found the links and just downloaded it. I was afraid to click on install because I'm not sure what it would do to Zoom on this computer that I'm running on right now. But it apparently takes uh, sounds of nature like uh, wind, birds, beach, geyser, forest, water, thunder, night, etc., and incorporates the movement in the frame into audio uh, from those different sources. So it's kind of a neural network. Uh, analysis of the imagery and translation into audio so it's kind of a i don't know i haven't listened to it yet but i'll see it and if they can figure that out they should be able to figure out why the engine malfunction light keeps staying on in my kia <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah it, it it the the we we dug and found it or or someone did um before you know but the uh, their actual, this is, this is a kind of a class. So number one is I think it's a great idea. Uh, I don't think that there's so many software synths out there that it, it's probably something that people will play with a little bit and then put down and not really do anything with, but it's, um, but from an engagement perspective of getting people to download something with your brand and having them play with it for a little while and, you know, connecting it to, to the overall thing, I think it's kind of fun. I hope, you know, and, and it probably wasn't super expensive to put, again, the tools to build these things are now re readily available. I mean, I'm sure it took some design and some build, but in the grand scheme of a marketing campaign, it's probably not a bad idea. Um, the one, the one fail was that they put up a, a YouTube channel, I mean, a YouTube, if you go to the watch that seventh scroll posted at the end, it gives you a URL that just blinks on for a second. And that URL takes you to a 404. <laughs> that's that, that's the that's the classic uh, marketing problem with uh, burning. We usually, what we try to do is put the link in the description <laughs> so that so that we can continue to update it. Because when you burn it into the video, you're kind of hosed, you know. So uh, so anyway, so it's interesting. Now, next question. Sky Gleason from Seattle and here on the panel is up next. He says a book will never be a movie, will never be a live stage show and so forth. Why do we compare these different presentations as if one has to be better than the other? Go ahead, Nigel. I think it's because we can't imagine them in any other form than we first got them. And uh, it takes a huge imagination sometimes to do that. I'll give you my, my best example of that, which is the book, The Curious in Incidents of the Dog in the Night, which, if you read the book, is written uh, from the aspect of someone who has autism. And if you see the Broadway or West End or on a good production of it, will just amaze you. But it's hard to imagine it if you don't have the imagination. Yeah, uh, go ahead, uh, Courtney. And it depends on the um, 
the length. You're you're constrained by time uh, on a you know a play or a movie or a television show. You're not constrained on time in a book. You can take as long as you want to read a book. The book can be as many pages as you want. Uh, these days, of course, television can go into long form, so they're experimenting with the. Uh, the serial story taking a, a longer book and spreading it across a multiple episodes in a in a series, but um, those kind of constraints make it hard to compare one to other. And the and the other thing is, you your mind is a uh, a terrible thing to waste, is a terrible thing to use, <laughs> and it uh, it conjures up the images when you read the words on the page. Your brain creates all the imagery if you have no other reference other than your imagination. Uh, once you see it uh, on screen, uh, you know it's not left to your imagination, so it'll look and behave completely differently, and people will sound completely differently than you imagined them when you read the uh, the book or the magazine article. So, uh, you know, your brain is a funny thing. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Sky. I just, I love that imagination, it seems to be the question here. And what does it bring to me as far as the other words we've been hearing throughout the day is the experience that I'm being, you know, given by whatever the event is. And I guess what, what spurred me to this is I'm currently listening on audio to uh, C.S. Forrester, the Hornblower series, the Captain Hornblower series, uh, Horatio Hornblower. And I read the books and now I'm listening to the audio but I just now found again the TV show and I'm starting to compare them all and they are all different experiences, but each have their own value. And the other thing I'm realizing is I'm learning a ton about the Napoleonic Wars completely. It's like, oh, oh, he's doing a narrative story about a character taking me on a, you know, a, a journey of a, of, of a man being a captain in the British Navy, but I'm learning history at the same time. And it's, I'm, I'm, but now I've got Google to go, where is that in, in Spain? Where is that in Italy? So I'm learning my geography. So I'm just curious, why do we have to force each of these different events to compare to the other and not enjoy them in and of themselves? Good, Bill. I agree with your, your initial sentence that one will never be the other, but we've had a lot of experiences with the fact that, oh, it was a really good book and they made a terrible movie out of it. Or it was a terrible, I thought the book was boring, but the movie condensed it beautiful and that was fun. And so each of these is a different art form to my way of thinking. And there are fans, There's there are people who resonate with that. Some people, you know, who would have thought that the comic books of youth would become these large movies franchise and that people would, you know, it's, it's not just the kids who grew up with the comics. It's everybody now who are watching those fundamental stories and extending the utility of what they were trying to say into a new medium. So I just think you have to take each medium on its own and say, is it a good thing that it's trying to be? Is the play a good play as a play? I don't care if it was a good movie. I don't care if it was a good audio book. Is it a good play? That's what matters. Good, Chris. Totally agree, Bill. You know, um, it, it's interesting. Reviewers have um, an agenda. You know, sometimes they just have to be a little controversial so people will talk about them. And then there's people around you that that want to share their opinions about something. And um, the old, I, I, I just got to say this is, you know, cynical Chris talking. The, the older I get, the less I really care about everybody else's opinion. Because I, I, more often than not, well, let me say it different. Often, I find something that I'm absolutely delighted with. And yet, if I listen to what everybody else was saying about it, they're just, you know, blowing a bunch of hot air just because, sometimes just because they want to hear themselves talk, uh, like me right now. But um, it's, I don't care. If I like it, I like it. It's just the way it is. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't have that. I don't have to compare these very often because I don't really read fiction. <laughs> so, so I, I, I like, I don't, I don't like, I just don't have time. So I, I, um, I will, um, I listened to uh, Ready Player One. I think that was the one that I, and then I, you know, and, and then I, the problem was, is that I, I found that this is the first time the Ready Player One was probably the first fiction that I had even experienced outside of a movie uh, for 20 years. And, um, because so many people, some of my friends recommended it, and I really enjoyed the the book. And then when I watched the movie, 
I think I, because I saw so much of the book, I both understood the movie to some degree better, but I also found the movie to be very disjointed because I was, because I had all these other storylines in there. And then I was like, I don't think I should do this again. <laughs> I just want to watch the movie. <laughs> like, like I just, It'll ruin the movie if I read the book. And so, so I, I, I think that I've decided that the order should be, I should watch the movie. And then if I like the movie, I should read the book. You know, then the book will just give me more information that, oh, now that makes more sense. And oh, that, so I know, so now I never want to see the movie. I never want to see the book before the movie because I want to deep in my understanding of something if I'm really into it. Um, but I rarely get to that level. Um, usually I have, I fill it with uh, foreign affairs. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. He says, when using ATEM minis and other small equipment in the field, do you send them out with deck savers? Uh, go ahead, Tom. Well, I don't go out into the field. I do use the deck saver. It's this hard plastic cover. Uh, generally, I find that the field comes to me because I have <laughs> someone who <laughs> tends to help me with my switching. Uh, that's yeah, funny. I know. Uh, but they do come in all sizes. Uh, he's not here today to talk about it, but Roscoe Jones, I believe, uses them. I had talked to him in after hours about mm -hmm. them, but love yeah, them. Go ahead. go ahead, Courtney. Uh, no, I don't use them. Because something like that, a hard cover, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about one exception I would send equipment out with. Um, a hard cover like that, you know, the ATEM is designed to be have the button presses. And if you don't have a cat who likes to lay on it while it's still on, um, you know, you really can't use the uh, item when it's on. So you have to take it off. Then you got to find some place to put it. And uh, in my studio and probably in a lot of other people's studio in my living room, horizontal space is at a premium. So finding some place to set it down to store it when I'm using my ATEM is the problem. Uh, so I would not use it since, and the ATEM has an elastomeric keyboard and just a top surface. So nothing's really going to hurt it uh, in travel. You just throw it in a case. It should be fine. Just don't put anything sharp or, or uh, you know, steel on top of it. it. It should travel just fine. The exception to that, because the ATEM is not battery powered, it only runs on a, an external AC power. Uh, the exception to that is remote controls. I always make sure remote controls are packed in a, in a uh, case in a, in a way that nothing can be pressing the buttons inside that case falling on top of the remote because then when you get to your location something's been pressed against the buttons on that remote control and the batteries will be dead so you have to take i take care in uh, and build little cubby holes inside foam cases in the foam in cases so that the remote can be held with nothing pressing on the buttons at all and it protects anything from falling on and pressing those buttons go ahead, jason Yes, I use them. Uh, anytime an ATEM goes into a Pelican, I absolutely put, um, yeah, I, I put one on. The other use case is for, um, for an X32 because it's such a large surface. Um, I just don't want to dust the mixer. And honestly, most of the driving that I do on the mixer is, is remote anyway. So, um, yeah, covering it has actually saved my bacon more than once because, you know, I drop a screwdriver and... Bunk just pops right off. You got it, Courtney. Yeah, I might point out that the silicone buttons on top of the ATEM are much stronger than that plastic, hard plastic cover that you put on it. The plastic cover will break before those silicon buttons will. Uh, next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana is up next. And the question is, we had a spot of bad weather over the weekend. Lots of trees down and heavy rain. What's your go-to weatherproof camera cages or covers? In a pinch, a trash bag. <laughs> we definitely, I think all of us at some point have used a trash bag um, and uh, cut a hole at the end of it, you know, at, at the end of it, put it around the thing and, and wrapped it around. So, I mean, if, you, if you're stuck without something to work with, we've definitely, uh, most of us have used that in production at some point in time. Uh, Porta Brace makes a lot of great, um, Porta Brace is the kind of the standard for um, getting water resistant uh, covers. Um, go ahead, Chris. You know, recently, uh, Doug Ferguson sent me a photo. There are these little tents that are made for uh, camping. People a lot of times will put like, you know, like really remote camping. They'll put their little porta potties in them so they have a little privacy or maybe just to change their clothes. These people were using them as little camera tents at outdoor sporting events. And I was like, that's really smart. You know, they have a... 
have a little window. And if you have to, you get cut something, you can get the lens out. But the yeah. guy's in there and he's out of the weather. Really, really smart idea. Yeah, and, and a lot of kind of, a lot of things people don't think about with outdoor is not it's not just the rain, it's the it's the sun. You know, the sun and the dust that that are that that's there. Um that, you know, the sun can really, you know, obviously can burn the operator if they're not if they're not even with enough sunscreen, you're sitting out there all day covering some event. Um, but also uh just just getting out of that um is is really important as well. Go ahead, Bill. Because I spent most of my career in Arizona keeping things off the camera, including the sun, which was one of the biggest challenges I had. So I had a lot of rigs to cover cameras. At the, the simplest was just uh, clamp on umbrella holders, and you can usually get them from uh, sports companies and things like that. Particularly golf umbrellas are very big and good. So that's from the top only. So if it's just a little tiny rain and it's not really coming down very hard, that'll take care of you. But we escalated up to the point where uh, we were in, uh, I, I used to call them changing rooms. A lot of those pop-up tent manufacturers make small ones uh, for changing rooms for uh, people who are going to the beach or camping or something like that. They work really well for those. Uh, and then as Alex was saying, we always had the Porta Brace line and they make not only the big bags and cases, but they make specific rain colors or rain covers that were cut for shoulder mount cameras. I don't see them as much for the less expensive cameras now, but there must be somebody making something like that. Go ahead, Jason. Jason, I think you might have frozen. Uh, Mitchell? Yeah, we were shooting an infomercial at Pleasure Island when it was open over at Disney World. And this giant thunderstorm came out of nowhere, which happens in Florida. And I was amazed that all of a sudden, everywhere, there were these little yellow ponchos that appeared for 50 bucks a pop. And um, because of the way the hood cuts out of it, it was perfect for the camera. So we just threw the camera in there, wrapped the uh, the top around the lens, and we were good to go. So sometimes you can pay a good price for it, even if you weren't expecting a thunderstorm. Good guy. Yeah, I first saw these at Chick-fil-A locally We're up in Seattle. It's always raining, and I was cracking up because they look like minions walking around. But here, here's what they look like, these <laughs> things. I don't know if you've seen them. <laughs> but yeah, they... They had these orange ones and they're walking around, but this is the same thing that uh, Chris was just talking about where you can throw your camera up inside of one of these uh, pods and um, have them stay reasonably like this one here. Where, so where one is that? What website up. is this? Well, it's called I'm, UTW Pods. I'll put a link in the chat. I think this is the original one here. It's like, crazystuff.com. Awesome. Crazystuff.com. Yeah, I'll put a link to this one. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that you wear them like a, oh, I'm, I'm so, I'm so confused. <laughs> like it's definitely not something I've seen before. No, it's like a, oh like a, gosh. like a backpack. It it's comes around tiny tent oh with, with, yeah, with holes for your feet. Oh yeah. my goodness. Like. <sighs> it's a little bubble. That's great. Okay. <laughs> there it is. That's, that's the one. So I can be outside, but not be outside. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Courtney. Yeah, I, I use the I keep a trash bag in all my cases uh, in case of rain. And, and one thing I want to do is try and find the ones that are uh, transparent, like this one. That way you can throw them over a camera and you can still see the menu controls. You can still see your viewfinder and everything and keep it safe from the rain. And uh, I find those to be quite cheap and quite available. Yeah, and, and the one thing I will say, uh, just as a last note, is always be prepared for this kind of thing. Like always have something that you're going to be able to cover things with. Um, we had one in Vegas where we, I might, I might've told the story before where we were, we just insisted on a tent. Like I was like, I'm not going to put any gear. I'm not going to work on the project if I don't have a tent, you know? And, um, and so they, they put the tent in for us and, uh, it was, it was, if someone had poured a bucket of water out of the sky, like it was just this insane rain, did millions of dollars of damage and all my gear was fine. <laughs> like, you know, like everybody else's gear around me was just destroyed. And it was just, it was, now I have to admit, I wasn't even protecting for rain. I was protecting for dust. You know, I was just like, I'm not going to be out there in the sun for eight hours and, and I put my crew out there. And so, but, but you want to be protected and have those things available. Go ahead, Tom. And of course, for small cameras, every time you stay in a hotel, make sure you take that shower cap. That's the free thing in the uh, bathroom. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, ne next question. We're almost out of time. Tony Mobley, Noonan, Georgia. Is there an Apple TV fix to be able to use the A10 Mini to stream Disney content in a Zoom meeting with errors? Uh, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Uh, real I don't quick. know about the with errors. Probably, probably talking about the problem that HDCP is uh, mm -hmm. 
causing a, an error message on the screen that says it can't display this content. And if you go mm -hmm. through a splitter, or uh, uh, I go through a, an HDMI recorder, which also removes the HDCP, you can find these cheap one to two HDMI splitters online that will remove HDCP. And if you put that in line between your uh, between your um, Apple TV and your ATEM, it should uh, allow it to pass that signal. Yep, I right, go ahead, Bill. Since you mentioned Apple TV specifically, they're very good at that DHCP kind of stuff. I've uh, tried to record or things. HDCP. HDCP, yeah, right. I, I tried to uh, record some content here or there, and I've run into more problems with Apple branded stuff than anything else because they're just taking it pretty seriously. It just, it's just a matter of AVU, AVU makes them. Um, they're HDMI, to, well, what we've done in the past is HDMI to SDI, and almost all of the cheap ones that are under $100 on, on Amazon, almost all of them will do a HDCP handshake but then not uh, pass it through because SDI doesn't carry that. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, uh, last question real quick. Tony Mobley, noon in Georgia. Is it still too soon to talk about Disney Plus series Obi-Wan Kenobi as a production? Uh, I don't think it is. I mean, we, we won't do it today because we're running out of time, but we can bring it up and, and talk about it. At this point, I mean, I, I don't know. I didn't finish it. I, I, I never thought that I would ever run into a time when I couldn't get enough Marvel and Disney and Star Wars, and I realized I was wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm saturated, and, and, and I just I haven't. I, I start watching them, and I'm like, I don't need to watch this anymore. Um, anyway, um, so there you go. Now we're uh, we're jumping subjects uh, to Mix Effect Pro. Uh, Adam Toe is here, and and Adam, it's great to have you back to talk about it. How have things been going? Things have been going well. Um... It's been about a year, actually over a year since I launched Mix Effect. The beta came out in March and then the fun, first release was in May. And the, the response has been tremendous. I've been really happy with, you know, how it's been received in the community and the, the uptake in, in sales and everything. It's been, it's been great, fantastic experience. And what, are the, what, are, what has been your biggest challenges? I think the biggest challenge is finding enough, at least today, it's finding enough time to work on it. Um, right. So as, you, yeah. as, as many of you know, just as a kind of disclaimer, I quit my job in um, January of this year and I joined Zoom. So I'm working actually with Andy Carluccio from Liminal on fun Zoom stuff. Yeah. But uh, in my spare time, I can do some work on Mixed Effect. That's great. That's great. And, um, and so, what, so what have you been working on? What are you, what are you adding? <laughs> well, I have a new release that's coming out very shortly. It's in app review right now. So it's the 1.6.4 release. Um, I have a little presentation. Let's see if this works. Yeah, let's I'm running this all through Mix Effect right now. So let's see if this works. Just this button, this, go. So let's see. Mix Effect 1.6.4 adds preliminary support for the new ATEM SDI switchers. So I don't have one right now. I'm waiting to get a loaner from Blackmagic. But I think I figured out how to, to support them. There's not much different from the existing A10 Mini and A10 Mini Extreme lineups. Um, there are some bugs with like keyboard shortcuts. I fixed kind of like I refactored the whole architecture uh, in improving compatibility with iOS 16 and iPad OS 16. Um, some rendering issues with Mac OS, and then there's some little niggling bugs that I found because it's when you run it on iPad OS 16, like things like break. So I had to like change some things on how like the view all presets page works. And then actually a bug that the office hours crew helped me find, uh, it's a startup bug, I fixed that crash. So you're, you've been testing a, a pre-release version of 164 for a couple of weeks now, um, and I think it's pretty stable. So hopefully once Apple uh, approves it, I'll be able to release it sometime today or tomorrow. That's great. And um, uh, we have a ton of questions. Do you have anything else you wanna show us before we before we jump into those? Uh, into the questions? Oh, sure. Um, let's see. There's a couple things. So earlier this year, I released a kind of announced um, Mix Effect Labs, which is my kind of like subscription and membership uh, program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, people who use Mix Effect know it's a paid, it's either paid up front or you, there's a single in-app purchase after you do the, the trial for 30 days. And I like that for a way of app distribution, but as we know, you know, apps are doing subscriptions today. And there's good reason for doing subscriptions because you get recurring revenue each and every month. Um, that might change with Mix Effect. It's not gonna change in, in the kind of the short term, but in the future, I might, I might switch up how the, how the pricing model works. But in the meantime, I kind of created this Mix Effect Labs, which is uh, an official site for the Mix Effect community. 
Um, there's going to be articles and resources to help people get up to speed with using Mixfect in their productions. But if you sign up to become like a member, you'll get access to exclusive articles, videos, beta releases of Mixfect, which I'll be talking a little bit, and then technical support office hours that I'll be holding periodically. And so that's kind of like what I've been trying to do to kind of create a recurring revenue base for the product so that I can create uh, and work on it more. Um, and be yeah, that's the hardest part. It. It's, it's really hard to live between one update and another, and especially in the Apple environment, it's harder because the, the updates are complicated, you know, to, because you have to kind of create a version one and a version two. And, and so those things become uh, a lot harder. Um, yeah, and it's, it's um, you know, I have to say that uh, I, obviously we use MixEffect very heavily here for this show. I mean, this is what, when you see these super sources and everything else, those are being Isadora is talking to MixEffect, and, and which is talking to uh, the ATEM. And, and so a lot of those things are put together, but I've done whole shows. Uh, I think that, I think I might've mentioned to Adam, I, I, I thought that the funny, funniest show that I had, I had a show in front of, I don't know, um, it's probably 25,000 people. And, um, and I have a, I had a two ME panel sitting in front of me. Um, but all I cut the entire show on mix. Effect. <laughs> like I literally just had these little buttons. And so I, I had this huge switcher and I'm sitting there going tap, 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 tap. And cause I was basically animating between super sources, you know? So when someone was talking, one got bigger and another one got smaller and then another one got, you know, and it was like, and it was going out to a lot of places and it was just, but it was really, I thought that the, there was something really funny about the fact that I had this really expensive panel and I'm just tapping on an iPad screen to do the entire show. I didn't plan to do it that way, but as I kept on making it more efficient trying to make it work. And, and I will say that before we, you know, go any further that I just think that if you have an ATEM, so if you're watching here and you have an ATEM switcher, you have to have Mix Effect Pro. Like it is, it 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 adds like five x value to your switcher. Like it's not like a little, especially once you have an extreme, because the big thing about it is once you have an extreme or higher. I mean, it it makes a difference for the setting things up for the for the um, the smaller switchers. But once you have something that has a super source, the ability to animate the super sources and to have much more control. Anybody who's tried to build super sources in ATEM, I mean, it's, I think it, it in, in the international community may consider it a form of torture. And so the, um, uh, so it, it is just truly a brutal experience. And with mix effect, it's just like, Oh yeah. And there's, you know, HDR graphics has a lot of other great things that are there that, that does that type of thing as well. Um, you know, John Barker does a great job in that it, it's a little bit, but mix effect pro is a little bit more organic, I think, and, and a little bit more, uh, flexible than, than what we're, you know, than what we've, um, and so I just think it's a, it's a must have kind of thing. Do you want to show us anything else before we, the, the questions are stacking up? Do you have any other, anything else you want yeah, to show there's, us? There's one more thing. So, yeah, um, absolutely. like I said, I'm using mix effect right now to do the, the, the show. So right now I'm running keynote. This is what's kind of going between the slides and I'm controlling it from my, my, um, iPad M1 iPad Pro that's running iPad OS 16. So right now what you're seeing is the super source. Um, and I can see if I can push this button. So if I click this button right here, this just goes back to the camera. And then this one goes to um, changes the super source for the keynote on one side. And, and, and so the, and so with that, you're having, you're just cropping off. You you have a 16 by nine presentation that you built inside of keynote and you're just cropping that. And, but it has the little animations and everything built into it, right? Right. It's just a standard super source animation. So it's just moving, it's cropping and moving my source, my camera source mm -hmm. over to the, over to the right, and then kind of yep. sliding in the, the keynote thing. But what's interesting is that mix effect is actually running in the background right now. So on my iPad, uh, I'm running keynote and that's sending the signal to the, through the HDMI to my ATEM. So in iPad input number two, that's running the, the keynote presentation. And the background is, is, is new, right? I mean, being able to run in the background. It's, it's definitely new. So you see this little icon that's in the, the keynote um, slide. Let's see if I can point to it, point to it right there. Um, so that's like a little floating window that's running on top mm -hmm. of the other applications that I have on my, on my iPad. And so what I'm seeing on my iPad is keynote on the left and shortcuts on the right. And so what I've done with shortcuts is I'm, it's basically the functioning like a companion Thing. So instead of pushing buttons on the companion, just pushing buttons on the ATEM. So if I want to go to, say, stage manager in the PIP, I can tap this and then you see how it just moves me. And if I stop the presentation, you actually see um, mix effect running in stage manager on the external display uh, on the iPad. 
So if I you can see my mouse, if I, if I do like an auto, I think it'll do transition to, to my camera. Now, if I push it again, it'll do that. So That's great. Um, a mix effect, the app is actually running in the background. So even though this, this version of mix effect that you see right here is mix effect um, is the one for iOS, iPad OS 15, but there's actually another mix effect that's running on this iPad that's iOS, iPad OS 16. And that's the one that I'm able to like control in the background. So I can be in like Safari or notes or mail, the mix effects is still running. And right. there's actually a little button that I can push in that floating window that does the auto transition or, or like a cut. So I'm just kind of over, took over the, um, the um, skip ahead 15 seconds or skip back 15 seconds. And I turned them into auto and cut buttons. That's great. Um, fantastic. And the background has been a big problem actually for, for me, for some of the stuff that we've done is like, oh, we need to make sure that we absolutely can't have it go into the background. So it's, I'm, I'm really excited to see that. So the, um, uh, yeah, it's great, great update. Um, so like, you know, and, and it's interesting. It's not, it's not like a whole bunch of big features or whatever. It's just things that make it run better, which is what, what a lot of us just need. And again, we're using it every single day for the show. So when you're watching the show get run, mix effect is part of that, that entire stack. Um, let's go ahead and um, anything else, Adam, before we jump into the questions, we've got, no, that's we good. had a lot uh, <laughs> come in. Answer. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and, uh, and jump into the questions. First one comes from Jonas Dattel in Stuttgart. Are there plans for enabling mix effect to serve as a server for other apps, uh, mix effect devices uh, to deal with the connection limit? Yeah. So this is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, unfortunately and it's not, and, and to yeah. back up, the, the issue is, is that um, you, you can have up to five connections to an ATEM, I think. Is that right? Is it, I think it's five. And, and five, so if, yeah. if you start having lots of people start to sign into your ATEM, so the thing that we get, what happens is we get excited because, wow, you can just, anybody can log into an ATEM anywhere. And so you get in a virtual event, you might get a bunch of people doing it, and then the ATEM crashes. <laughs> so so it, it's, it's, not, it's not happy. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. So I actually have um, <clears throat> Mix Effect running, I think, on... So there's iPads running two copies, and then you see in the background, I have another iPad that's running three, and then I might have my, my, my iPhone. So that's like four. So <clears throat> if I fired up like ATEM software control, that'd be five and that'd be at my limit. So there's been a desire to have, you know, ATEM or MixFec run as kind of like a proxy. And it's a long-term plan, but it's not something that I've actively been developing. There is a, um, a project that's written by the guy who did the, Black Magic module for Companion called ATEM Proxy. It's on GitHub. I'll post the, post the link in the chat here. Uh, let's see, in the event chat. And <clears throat> I think some people are using it to as a proxy for ATEM, so you can connect to that, and then it connects to the ATEM. So I'll take a look at that project first, and then hopefully, if I have time, I can work on something like Mix of X Server in the future. That's great. Uh, next question. Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Belbin is up next with, I'd love to see Blackmagic Design provide a supported ATEM control gateway type app that's platform agnostic or have ATEM support OSC directly for external control scenarios, but they seem deaf. What would be an effective way to get some action from Blackmagic? I would keep contacting their support, maybe send an email to Grant. I don't know. Um, just keep pressing them every chance you get. If you go to like IBC coming up in Amsterdam, uh, talk to those reps there. Just keep pressing it. Um, you know, right now they only have the SDKs for uh, Mac OS and Windows, uh, but a lot of people, as 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 the uh, the question raised, you know, there's a lot of these third party things. So the more pressure we put on them to give alternate solutions, I think they might be encouraged to do that. I mean, they do have like the Ethernet protocol which seems to be kind of the way they're doing APIs. Um, the Ethernet protocol for ATEMs is somewhat rudimentary. I mean, you can change like kind of the inputs and outputs, uh, but you might imagine they could expand to be something similar to like the HyperDeck protocol, which you can do basically do anything you want on the HyperDeck through that. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the hard part is, no, no and, and Mix Effect handles OSC, right? So you can send mix. You can send. You can use Mix Effect as a as a gateway to to make those commands. Is that is that correct? Is that accurate? Yes, yes. So you send Mix Effect the OSC command, and it translates that to the ATEM protocol, 
and send right. that to the ATEM switcher. Yeah, and, and, and I think that the thing that we always have to understand around when we, we want developers to, or we want hardware manufacturers or, or whatever to open up their thing and make a new protocol available, a new protocol means a new set of things they have to support. So this is, a, this is not, this will be a new person <laughs> or, a new, pe or a new, new group, and it will be new requests and it'll be new, you know, so I think we always have to kind of keep in mind that they, uh, what I will say in, in defense of, of black magic is that they are probably one of the most ar open architectures of any video company in the world. Um, you know, so the API, the, the, the amount of work they put into the, into the SDK, the amount of hooks that they put in is unparalleled in what we do. And it's one of the big reasons that we, that I use, you know, black magic hardware is because I know that if I need to go in there and control it, then I need to build something else. And, and, you know, the whole industry that, that Adam's taking advantage of is all built because they built this wide open architecture for them to take on something else is, is an expense and they have to make a decision about whether there's going to be enough people to pay for that expense. And I'm not, I'll be honest with you. I'm not given that there's already tools that like mix effect pro that act as a gateway. I'm not sure that the, that there's a lot of, um, that, that, that the ROI is there for black magic to do that. We, we always think about it. We just want requests to be fulfilled, but there's a bit, there's gotta be a business model for that request to be fulfilled. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Adam, I'm curious. Have you ever considered, uh, what it would take if Grant called you up and said he wanted to buy your software outright? What do you have a price price in mind? I have a number in mind. <laughs> but, yeah, but um, yeah, no, no comment. I guess. <laughs> well, and and I think I think that I think that the 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 issue is is that I think it's very good for Black Magic to have a an eco you know an ecosystem that is thriving and buying up the companies that that do it is not usually the best way to keep the ecosystem going. So I think that'll be the, that'll be that, that would be the challenge, but yeah, they could decide that they just wanted to stop using there. What I will say is what I love is the fact that I have a very basic, easy to use black magic software that if I need to open it up, it's the one that they support. If I need to go in there and make some adjustments, I can do it. But then I have this kind of much more robust system within mix effect that, that makes that work, um, you know, more deeply, but they're only having to worry about the basic things that are required to actually run the switcher. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael up next. What accessibility features or provisions have you thought of for mix effect to enable disabled users to operate ATEM switchers? So Apple gives a lot of uh, abilities for developers to make their apps accessible. And I admit that I haven't done the kind of the legwork to use things like voiceover. It might work. I just haven't tested those. You basically kind of like hint different buttons and stuff, and then you give it like labels. And then when the user turns on like voiceover, they can just, you know, iterate through the things and say, you know, I want to push this button. Um, there's a lot of buttons in mix effect. So I'd have to add a lot of these kind of like hints. What I've tried to do though is is let Mix Effect be controlled in a variety of different ways. So if you're on a Mac, uh, Apple Silicon Mac, you can use your your mouse and your trackpad with a pointer. If you're on an iPad, you can use Touch. You can create shortcuts uh, and use Siri. And now with the the kind of the upcoming iOS 16, iPad OS 16 versions that support background operation, I think using shortcuts is going to be um, a lot easier, a lot more powerful because you can run Mix Effect in the background. And then also OSC. So the ability to kind of control it through a companion interface uh, and just push push those buttons. So there are some accessibility features, but they're not necessarily the ones that kind of like Apple is, is promoting right now. Um, but it's something that I'm definitely looking forward to adding in the future. Next question. Peter Belbean in Houston, Texas says, if there was a gateway, and he put that in quotes, running on a single small computer to which other ATEM controlling apps connected instead, it might provide relief from connection limits and improve the ability to use multiple mix effect instances. Is that a possibility? Yeah, again, that's that's similar to the ATEM proxy that I mentioned before. One thing that I um, is possible, though, so there is a uh, kind of like a beta version of the feedback system that's built in the mix effect. I'm actually changing it from kind of the OSC version of the feedback to using HTTP server that's built in. And there's documentation on how to access that. And uh, what I'm thinking about doing is using that because basically you call mix effect and you say, give me the state of the ATEM and it just dumps out this big JSON file. And then from there, you can actually uh, do whatever you want. I know in office hours, you're using it to kind of give feedback for Isidore for like the tally lights. Um, and so one one possibility is to uh, create like apps that then talk to that 
feedback system and then do things like tally. So maybe, uh, so you're not actually pinging the ATEM for tally information, you're pinging mix effect for that. Um, and I can certainly see that being extended in the future to do things uh, that the question is posing. That's great. Um, uh, next question. Peter Balbean. Oh, I'm sorry, that one's done. Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware up next. Adam, any plans for improving the HyperDeck remote control? Uh, maybe. <laughs> so, so there's, um, so like, for instance, the Blackmagic released the HyperDeck Shuttle HD, I think that's the name, the one with the little dial and it has a teleprompter. And there's no way to um, kind of like switch modes between like teleprompter mode and playback mode without going through those menus. You have to push is like really hard to push little tiny button and you have to like scroll a little bit and hit set to change it to teleprompter. Um, but there's an easier way. You can use the ethernet protocol to basically do a one line function to, to, to control. And actually, let me see if I can bring that up so you can see how easy that is. So I'm gonna push this button, see if it works. Okay, and then let me switch to the iPad so I can see on my screen. So I'm gonna bring up shortcuts here. Hopefully this will work. And I'm gonna go to all shortcuts. You can see all my shortcuts. Type HyperDeck. Um, HyperDeck teleprompter. So you can see here that uh, this is a shortcut. Basically, you give it the IP address of the HyperDeck. There's a menu prompt. If you want to switch it to teleprompter mode. Um, and then all it does is it sends this HyperDeck command. So this is part of the HyperDeck uh, Ethernet protocol. You can read it in the HyperDeck manual. It's a, at the end of the, the manual. And you just send it commands. And so what this would do, if I had that, it would set it to um and this is not using x pro mode. right this is this is just talking directly to the hyperdeck it, it's it's using mix effect is sending the command oh, but it. okay it's it's mm -hmm. it's sending it directly to the to the hyperdeck right. through um like a telnet so that so so mix effect just to make sure people understand what they're looking at there mix effect you built these the the hooks for these these um shortcuts and so you right. can create these shortcuts that are going through mix effect pro into the into the uh, through the th switcher into the hyperdeck That's or is exactly it talking right. directly to the or is it talking directly to the hyperdeck it it would it talks to mix effect and mix effect talks directly to the hyperdeck with sending right. those commands right. so another thing is like you know in the atem software control interface there's like actually in the atem software control, there's no way to switch your disk so you have to like i don't know you have to like pull the disk out and put the disk back in for it to recognize the the disk so this this a uh, simple shortcut basically says which which um, hyperdeck do you want to? But first, it detects which hyperdeck you have, and then it says, "Oh, which slot do you want to like switch? Do you want to switch to slot one, two, or three? And basically, and then it just sends that command, and then it you see in your hyperdeck interface, it just updates the, you know, the the list of files for that for that disk that you're connected to. So this is kind of the way that I'm doing um, the Kind of like extending HyperDeck control within MixEffect, it's by using uh, the Ethernet protocol. So instead of building it within uh, MixEffect, which is actually using the Blackmagic ATEM protocol to talk to Mic to talk to the HyperDecks, which is much more limited than using the Ethernet protocol. But that's how I'm kind oh, of interesting um, doing that. And what's what's so limited about the way the ATEM talks to the HyperDeck versus the Ethernet control? It just has a far more limited control set. It can do like play, hmm. next clip. It can, I think it can do, it can do the jog and shuttle, mm -hmm. but it can't select discs. Um, huh. it, it can select discs, but only the two, like the SD card disc. It can't do like right. the USB in the new right. HyperDex. Mm -hmm. um, and it can't switch the, like the file formats. So right. like if you have files that are, if you, if your HyperDeck has like files in H.264 and in ProRes, you can't like switch between the two. You have to go into the HyperDeck kind of like control interface, or you can run a shortcut that then says switch HyperDeck playback to H.264, you know? Oh, because usually with a HyperDeck, it, it, they all have to be the same on the, on the, on the same card. It, you're able, are you able through the Ethernet to change that? Is that yeah. like change what yeah. it sees? So you could have yeah. three different formats on the card and it'll say just only... Because usually what happens is the first the first file that goes in 
defines it. Like if we don't have any con external controls, the first file that comes in. So if you put in an Apple ProRes 422 and an H.264, the first, whatever the first one is, is what it won't see the other ones. So you're talking about, you could have different formats there and, and have it look for the, the formats that you wanted. That you want. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's you, really you interesting. You can't say show both ProRes and H.264. Right. You, you have to choose which one you want. That's super interesting. Um, uh, next question. Oh, Mitchell, I'm sorry. Mitchell, I skipped you there. Yeah, I, I was going to say, wouldn't it be wonderful to manage a playlist on a hyperdeck, which you can't do currently, or set top and tail uh, points? That would be wonderful if that could ever happen. Yeah, you can do it through through a shortcut. It's uh, not as, you know, right. the interface is not as nice. The there hooks are, are there. Um, yeah, the hooks are there. There are a couple of uh, kind of third-party apps for kind of improving the hyperdeck. So the, the makers of Touch Director, which is kind of like a, uh, an ATEM controller. Um, they have two apps, Hyper Slow and Hyper Synchron, which do stuff with Hyperdex, like the, like for instant replaying things. So there may be some uh, functionality there to do what you need. I would mm -hmm. take a look at those those apps. Next question. Jonas Dattel and Stuttgart's back up with, are there plans for a headless mix effect with OSC and or HTTP APIs? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, again, that kind of ties in with uh, the MixFX server and the, the proxy. Um, you could run MixFX, you know, like on your Mac, just keep the window open, like <laughs> visible, and then it kind of runs as a headless server because you can be doing other things. Um, the other thing is like, I, I, I'm not doing it right now, but like I sometimes run MixFX like on an iPod Touch, so the seventh generation, the last one, and I talk to that using OSC or or HTTP for the feedback. And that's um, acts as kind of like my my server. Next question. Peter Belbin's back from Houston with last time I uh, asked, MixFX was not using an officially provided and supported ATEM client for communications with the ATEM. Some users of unofficial clients have seen problems with their ATEM and refuse to use such tools. How will you fix that issue? I can't as long as Blackmagic doesn't have a an official SDK for iOS and iPadOS. Um, I don't think I'll be porting the mix effect like the Mac version to the official SDK because uh, honestly, that SDK looks it's I don't know the the that that the code that they're using in the functions just does I just don't understand it. I just don't grok it. But like Swift Swift UI, I really understand how that works, um, and that's what I'm more comfortable with. So. No. Tell, tell Blackmagic to get those iOS and iPadOS SDKs out and you might see an official version. That's great. <laughs> um, next question. John Foltz is back from Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania. Video players in TriCasters are powerful and easy to use. The ATEM to HyperDeck solution, not as good. Have you thought of fixing the HyperDeck to ATEM connection like you fixed the super source? You'd be a legend, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, again, right now, my, my focus is on the... Not so much on HyperX since I don't really use them that much. So I would suggest take a look at the shortcut support. Um, look, become familiar with the HyperDeck Ethernet protocol and then start writing shortcuts. And on iPadOS 16 and iOS 16, shortcuts run a lot faster. So the performance is going to be a lot better than on previous versions. Good, John. Nope, can't hear you, John. What? Uh, I agree with John with this on this. It was super nice out of the TriCaster. The DDRs and the TriCaster are super nice, super integrated, and mostly work if your TriCaster doesn't. And the, crash. I was going to say the frame, the frame loss doesn't bother you or the sync yeah, issues. No, right. I mean, you know, like you know, like that's the. I mean, I would say that the DDR on the TriCaster is very convenient. You know, like convenient. but convenient, convenient. It's just not very stable. You know, like so. So the um, like I mean the the I have a friend who does a lot of lot of um uh, I won't name we've friend of all of ours, but, but does a lot of stuff on a TriCaster. And the first thing that he said was, don't use the DDRs ever. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, you know, like we, the first thing we do is we bring, now they bring an EBS in, but they're like, you know, we have, they have a TriCaster because all the graphics were built on it. But the only thing they do with it is switch. In fact, I think they actually bring the graphics in separately too. <laughs> like they're just like, they don't want the, it, the TriCaster has a funny problem with lag um, on that, where it, it, uh, it, all, a lot of playback. If you're, if you're used to hardware, 
and you're not used to you, you you'll look over it if you're using soft if you're used to software because software a lot of software does this but if you're used to hardware doing things you'll see this weird little hitches in in tricasters all the time and so anyway yeah go ahead adam yeah one more thing it's there's also an app called live app pro uh and that does playback for video files that are on running on ipad uh, and they're the developers, Max and Oscar, are doing tremendous work. Um, so I would take a look at that app um, because, you know, that might be a potential solution for replacing the HyperDeck. Like yeah, and, and a, a unique time. We don't know when we'll get Adam back. So if you have more questions, uh, go ahead and, and uh, throw those in. He's pretty busy most of the time and his ability to talk to us is limited. So um, because of his other work. And so um, so definitely throw those questions in in the, in the next little bit of time. We're running through these. Que Adam's very concise running through these questions pretty quick. So we've got a little extra time. So um, go ahead and throw those in. Let's go to the next question. Mitch Hill of Wilmington, Delaware and here on the panel. Is MixFX supported on the latest companion release? It is. So let's, let's have a not so simple an answer. Um, so the there's two modules. You can use the OSC to control mix effect, or you can use the mix effect native module. And so the mix effect native module, the current version, I think, supports all the commands that I added in the 1.3 release of mix effect, which is somewhat old. I've added a lot, a lot more, uh, but you can access those through OSC. I don't think the module supports the new ATEM SDI models, but since they're so similar to like the ATEM Extreme and ATEM Mini, you can probably just say it's that and then it will just work um, minus kind of the extra aux outputs. So one thing is that, you know, development on the, the module has slowed somewhat because the original developer, he got COVID at the beginning of the year and haven't been able to kind of get in contact with him. Um, so I'm looking for another developer to kind of help me kind of take the module to the next step. Um, so one thing is adding the much desired feedback support. So when you push like a program button, you see it like light up in red instead of no, no color. Um, and that would, I need to rewrite that to use the HTTP server that I added in a, in a previous release of Mix Effect. So if anyone out there knows how to write companion modules, I'm looking for someone to help me with that. So raise, raise your hand out there and get in contact with me. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, are there plans for an Intel compatible mix effect engine to control ATEM devices from legacy Macs? Yeah. So the reason why the mix effect works on Apple Silicon Macs is because I just check a checkbox and then it runs it as if it's an iPad app. So to convert it to run on legacy Intel Macs, I'd have to convert it using like Catalyst. And that uh, requires a little bit more effort um, on my part to to make sure that it works and i'm not sure if i have the time to do that right now so the longer i wait the, the, my thinking is that the the longer i wait the faster people will be adopting apple silicon and replacing their intel mac so they'll just use that version of mix effect so it's possible but i wouldn't hold your breath what are your biggest challenges with you know just what are the, what what do you think you need from black magic to do more with mix effect pro uh, from Black Magic, I mean, the the ATEM protocol is pretty well doc well, unofficially documented. You know, whenever they release new features, it uh, support comes pretty quickly. They they don't really uh, tell me like, for instance, the ATEM Constellation HDs. They had that new timer feature, the counter overlay, and so I got um, I got some loaners from Black Magic, and I basically like use Wireshark to like look at what was happening when you pushed the button on ATEM software control. And I basically <laughs> kind of like reverse engineered what was happening. Um, unfortunately, they're not going to go out and tell you this information because it's the ATEM protocol is undocumented. They would say use the SDK, but the SDK doesn't really, <laughs> doesn't really tell you that much. It just says what parameters you need to send using the SDK kind of functions. So it would be nice, you know, if, if that protocol were a little bit more open up, um, and that they could kind of tell us in advance, maybe that these things are, are coming. Um, and do you so have any issues where they are doing. they changing that protocol often, or is it something that you know? So it's undocumented. Sometimes the reason, of course, people don't document it is because then you're kind of pouring concrete, and it means that you have a bunch of people that will complain every time you change it. So do you see? Is it is it uh, fluid? Are they changing the way the A the A10 protocol works? It's not, not from what I've seen. Um, 
I mean, if they release, you know, ATEM software control, the firmware is at what, 8.8 right now? If they release mm -hmm. 9.0, then <laughs> that could be like in, involved significant change. So I know when they went from 7.6, like the 7.x to the 8, there's a significant difference. Like if you were to run or try to run mix effect on like an ATEM television studio HD that's running the 7.6, it wouldn't run. It would like crash on startup. So if, if Blackmagic were to say like, the next generation of ATEMs are now running 9.0. I expect things to uh, not be compatible. So they seem to take, you know, major releases when they break things. And so then that would be a, that, that usually is um, kind of a, a fire drill for you, right? I mean, cause it's really just trying to, and, and cause, because it's not documented, you pretty much have to go back to just observing how it's communicating back and forth with the switcher. Yeah. I mean, I think the, all the other developers who were, doing like kind of unofficial ATEM uh, protocol APIs, we'll have to get together. With a bunch Do you guys of trade a lot of notes? Does everyone, does everyone trade notes with each other about who, about the development? Some of us do, yeah, yeah. I think we should probably do a little bit more, but again, most of the stuff is already pretty well documented or understood. So there's not right. much kind of like things that need to be kind of figured out. It's for right. me, some of the things that, that have been figured out, I just haven't implemented yet. So like, for instance, like camera control is, is a little complicated because you have to support all the different cameras. And that's why I haven't really added camera, camera control support to mix effect yet. Yeah, no, absolutely. It would be great, especially if mix effect is taking the OSC and then, and then pushing it out is, is once you open up that camera control, it means that you're opening it up to everything else, you know, so it'd be, that'd be amazing. Uh, uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Peter Belbin in Houston. Blackmagic Design is, quote, open about using the provided and supported client APIs, Mac and Windows only. But they are not open currently regarding the over-the-wire protocol. Is this And this contributes to the reliability issues of reverse engineering clients. So I don't see a question there, mostly just a statement. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, ATEM software control is going to be probably much more reliable since it's using the official SDK. Um, all the, you know, unofficial things. So, uh, mix effect, the black magic module, that's part of companion, um, things like that. They're, they're always, they might always have some problems connecting or like disconnecting because of some weirdness, um, not doing things like the proper way. Um, there are SDK apps that are out there. I think like central control uses the official SDK. Um, I think the, uh, there's like a PowerShell thing for Windows that uses the official SDK. Those probably be more reliable. Um, it's just, you know, hopefully Blackmagic will <laughs> open it They're up. They're more reliable, but just more, tricks. just more limited, right? They're just, they'll do what they, what you want them to do. They just don't do as much. Well, I think you could write an SDK app that does what Mix Effect does. It's just, for me, it'd probably take me like three years to write it because it's, it's, it's like, it's like C++ or something like that. It's like pointers and things. <laughs> I right. don't want to deal with those. Um, it's, it's just that no one has really kind of done that. Cause I think right. it's, it is complex, the, the SDK versus all these kind of third party um, APIs and libraries are just much more easier to, to consume and to, right. to use. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Uh, next one comes from me, actually, and I was just wondering which languages or programming environments you would recommend to young people uh, these days as they're starting out so they have good prospects for employment in this future. Are you seeing a change in how people program apps and things like that? Well, if you're certainly looking for apps, there's native or there's uh, things like React Native. So you're using kind of like web technologies to write your apps. <laughs> How's that? How do you, what, what's your opinion of React? I've only used it very briefly and it was, it felt very foreign to me. Um, I have experience as like a web developer, but kind of more like web 2.0. This is like well, web 2.5, not quite yeah. 3.0. And it's just, it just felt weird um, versus kind of designing native just feels, at least with Swift and Swift UI, feels much more uh, approachable for me for like Objective C, UI kit, app kit development always felt kind of, uh, you had to do so much just to get it to, Put like a button on the screen yeah it was with this new stuff i think it's it's much easier so like it depends if you want to be like an app developer definitely you know go native with swift and swift ui on on ios or ipad os or mac os 
I just, I, I think that I, I have to admit my experience of working on development teams with React is that it looks really pretty on the outside. And as soon as you dig in, you start pulling at things and everything just kind of, just, just kind of wraps around, you know, it's, you think that you're going to save money because on paper, it's like, oh, I can develop for both platforms and it'll be really straightforward. And it just never turns out that way. The amount of time you're spent and you spend fixing all the things that are broken that you could have just wrote two native apps. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, John. If I was to contribute, I would say uh, regular JavaScript and then Node.js, those two. Yeah. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Sky Gleason in Seattle. If there is time, would Alan Adam be willing to use to do a two minute tour of Mix Effect for someone who has never seen the tool, a basic little demo? Yeah, that's, that'd be great. Oh, you can certainly do that. So let's um, push this button here make this bigger for myself. <clears throat> so, so again, I'm running mix effect on, um, on my iPad pro, um, running stage manager. So it looks kind of like a Mac, but it's, it's really the iPad and this is the interface. So you have, um, your basically your switcher, um, uh, which is kind of like the control panel. You, if you want, you can go to like the audio so you can see my audio waveforms here. You have macros, uh, you have all your media right here. Uh, transition. So this replicates kind of what you would see in a temp software control and like those panels on the right hand side. So I want to change like parameters for my transitions. I could like do this and you can see I'll like change it to like a dip transition and I'll just push the auto button and you'll see it transition to me like that. Okay. Um, you have access to the upstream keyers. So for instance, if I wanted, this is an ATEM uh, mini extreme ISO. So I have four upstream keyers. So if I had a Luma key on here, and let's just see what happens if I push this on air. And then I'm actually running <clears throat> H2R graphics on my Mac. So let's just see if this actually works. I don't know if it will work, but something appears. Okay, nothing appeared right now because I don't think I had time to configure it. But you have access to your upstream keyers. If you wanted to show like a DVE, so if I wanted to say, bring this DVE on air, guy here, you'll see my picture appear in the, in the corner. What's great about mix effect is that you can kind of use your touch to like expand stuff. So I can like use my finger to do this, or I can like, I can use multi-touch to make this window bigger. Like this. Okay. Just in case people are wondering if you haven't used the, the ATEM software, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> like at all. All right. So. This is probably the, the key feature of Mix Effect, which is its super source um, controls. So you see, I've been switching between three different views in during this presentation. I've been switching to this camera view here, and then this view here, and then when I was doing my keynote, I was doing this view here. And I'm and not when I was the keynote right now, so that's why you see the background of of the iPad. And when I was describing what I what I was talking about earlier, which is that I was just tapping little things, that's what I did here. You see those little things there that I had like four of them, and I just simply tapped on those little windows. Go ahead, go ahead, Adam. That's right. So, so with Mixfec, you can basically create SuperSource presets very easily. So, if I were to uncheck this lock icon, I can now like manipulate and move my window, and you can see like my window moving on the screen and in the little preview here. So, if I go off screen, it's actually off screen here. I put myself right there, right there. And if I wanted to like save this as a new preset, I can just like tap this and just say, I'll call this stage manager plus. Now it's not going to appear here because I'm actually filtering on a preset that I created. But if I type stage manager, you'll see um, the two ones that I created. So now I can like tap this and you see my face kind of like moves. And it does this transition where it knows where the super source boxes are positioned so that it intelligently does a transition like this. And there's different styles that you can do. So for instance, if I wanted a, a style that's like a uh, bounce, I could do some fun things like this, or I like bounce. I probably want to make it a little slower. So you can change the transition speed like this, like this. Um, and What's good is that for your super source presets, you can edit them and then you can say something like, uh, you can set your box sources. So you can say, whenever I go to this preset, I only want box one to be this source. I want box two to be this source. And let's say, I don't care about what box three and four are. And then I can set like a custom speed. 
So for instance, I want to set this one to be slow. I want a custom animation. Say, let's say use the bounce one. And then <clears throat> I could also optionally choose to run a macro when I'm going to the preset or when I leave the preset, I can run another macro. So if I just tap this, I can have access to all my macros right here that do a, a bunch of stuff. So let's just save this one here. And um, we'll also make this box a little bigger. I'm probably like a lot bigger right now. I'll just move it right there. And I'm gonna save this preset by long pressing. So now what you'll see here is that um, it does a little balance like that and then a slow balance like that. So if my style for the default style was like sine wave and I did this, you'll see I just move like this. But if I click this one because it has a custom um, style and a custom speed, it does that. So you can do some pretty um, fancy um, designs with your super source. So for instance, if I showed all my super source presets and I can go here, you can see if I go to grid mode, you can see all the presets that I have. So you can basically, you know, I want a side by side. I want, you know, this with the panelists, um, all different things. And you can actually, um, like and, I said, and again, have, I, I just have to keep on underlining. This is not the way the ATEM software works at all. Like this is a small little hell, um, like that is saving macros and then touching everything. So it's not just saving the macros. It's making sure that you touch every item that you want to be saved into the macros. And you, you and it is just a mind numbing process that is super frustrating. And it's why I'm always so excited about Mixed Effect Pros because super sources really do a uh, ATEM extreme or higher when you're thinking about a switcher is because you have these super sources, because you can move these around. And, um, but they're almost, they're just barely useful in the vanilla, what you get with an ATEM. I mean, they're there. And what, and that's why Mix Effect Pro is so important is because it, it unleashes them, you know, just, just makes them suddenly super fluid and you can design anything you want and save lots of them. Yeah. yeah so and not have to like think about how to export it out or anything else. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So some other powerful things like um, on ATEM Mini Extreme, you have four boxes for super source, but you also have two DVEs. So you could have a six box uh, super source. And so you can do that by running a macro. So for instance, if I were to click this and let's see what happens. Um, that is not the right thing because uh, let's try this one. Oh, it's because I have the, oh, there we go. So you see, I have six boxes. So the first two boxes, the first four boxes um, are the super source ones. But then if you look in my upstream keyers here, if I switch to the iPad, if I can do that, let's see if I can go back to this. So if you look in the upstream keyers, you see that two of them are kind of like overlaid on top. Um, and that's because upstream keyer one is, is using, um, is that second box right here, there? And then upstream keyer two is the, the other box. So I can make it one disappear. So what the super source preset is doing is that when you go to that preset, it runs this macro that basically says, um, show the six grid layout. And then when I leave it, it basically turns off the two DV. So you could actually use mix effect to do like a six, a six up display if you wanted to. And can it animate those upstream keyers as well? The position of those? Yes. So like everything else. Keyers, so let, crazy. Me, let me show you this. So um, let's say I wanted this, this particular DV, let's, let's on air. So now we see it's like the color bars. And I wanted animated to this position. So if you scroll to the bottom, there's a thing called automations. And it gives you a couple ways to, to con basically send this command. You could add a shortcut or you can send an OSC message. And that gives you all the parameters you need to do to enter it into companion. And then when you run it, you can also set a custom animation. So if I say I wanted to run over a second and I wanted to do like a bounce. So let's say I wanted to save this. Um, let's Click add to Siri. This is testing in real time. So let's uh, try this. Okay, so it created that um, shortcut. So now what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm actually gonna move this guy over here and I'm gonna make him smaller. I'm gonna make him smaller. Okay. 
So now I'm going to bring up shortcuts here and let's hope it didn't just crash. Okay. So now shortcuts is not working here. So I'm going to actually open it on my iPad display. Okay, so I'm looking at my iPad right now, and I'm just going to run this shortcut, and let's see what happens to that guy. Oh, this is running, sorry, this is running Mix Effect Pro. So actually, it should work. Let's see. Let's try this. The wonders of live demos that, that weren't prepared for, <laughs> that weren't even prepped or practiced. Definitely not prepared for this. Okay. That's not working, but I can do it this way. So I'm going to go back to automations. And I'm going to say send OSC message. Fine. Let's change this. Number three. Okay. And then edit this in shortcuts. So um, let's try running this now. So. I don't think the OSC server is running on here. So, um, yeah, let's just make sure this works. One, four, five. Automations. OSC server is running. Okay, let's try this. Port 4990. Verify that. Okay. Let's try that one more time. Okay, obviously there's something <laughs> not working well, in this demo. We, again, yeah, it's, dem demos are hard, especially when you don't work, prep them. Yeah, go ahead. If it were to work, the the upstream here would kind of like move. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Sky. I'm just uh, remember Guy Cochran going. I just discovered this new thing, and I remember <laughs> the day. Remember that day when he introduced. Yeah. The, the the community and the community was introduced to this, but I had not had any experience with it. And to Alex's point, yeah, the the simplicity of the previous uh, the ATEM software that I use, I, I I didn't know. I'm sorry. Where have you been? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. This was amazing. Thank you for that tour. That again is inspirational and and I and also the depth that you could get lost into. Yeah. The rabbit trails but I, yeah. I the one question i had when you do the bounce can you add a sound effect <laughs> <laughs> you no know, there's no audio that's coming from mix effect although you know it's it's you it's, could it's send out a command i have the you know i'm outputting something through hdmi so i could be sending audio or you could or you could send it to you send a command via osc to qlab you know and have it play it out at the same time so there, yeah. there's lots of ways of tying that together Hasmuk? there's a there's a oh. couple more things just real quick I just want to oh, yeah. show yeah, yeah, before yeah. we Absolutely. finish up. So again, SuperSource, pretty pretty powerful feature. Um, you have access to the color generators. If I had HyperDex plugged in, they would like show up right here. Um, you can set your outputs um, using the auxiliary outputs. Um, and then you have control over like live streaming if you have the A10 that has supports recording or streaming. Um, one cool thing about this is that you can actually... Um, um, add new streaming services down here. So if I wanted to add, uh, I have multiple ones here. Uh, if I wanted to add something for a new video service that just came out, I could just create a new one right there. Um, and then add stream keys and, and whatnot here. This is like a fake one right here. Um, <clears throat> and even add different streaming kind of quality settings here. And then with record stream, I can just like add stuff right here and capture the still and then change the time code right here, set it to device time. Um, there's also an ATEM simulator. So if I push this, basically simulates a mythical ATEM 1ME with four MEs. So you can just like play around with the interface, but it doesn't really do anything. And so like one of the things I've been thinking about maybe in the future is having a, a like a, a version of mix effect that's like a, a FOTEM. So it takes the cameras on the iPhone or the iPad and actually binds them to like inputs one, two, three, four, right? And it's outputting the the microphone output. But for all intents and purposes, it's it's an ATEM. So you could control it using mix effect or you can control it using 
ATEM software control. Um, that's one of those kind of like projects that I'd like to do. If I have the time, I just have to uh, learn up how to, how to basically connect all the different bits and parts on an iPhone or an iPad up to these inputs. Um, yeah. That's great. Hasma. Yeah. I think Adam said earlier, his biggest challenge is time. So I'm amazed that he finds time to answer our questions and difficulties in Discord or Slack. So I've been using, I was explaining to Adam earlier that I used Mix Effect completely for my medical, last medical show, more intensely than I did ever, especially with the super sources. And Adam showed that macro within the presets. So I didn't realize I had a macro. So every time I selected the preset, it would switch my cameras and I couldn't understand why. So I pinged Adam on Discord and boy, he was right there explaining to me that I have a macro running. I'm telling him I don't have a macro running. And eventually I went to the list view of the presets, Adam, and that's where I saw the macro. And that's where I could edit that macro. So when you edit the preset in the main setup, you, you don't really catch that. But if yeah, it's in list scroll view, down. yeah, with a list view, you have to scroll down and pick it up. So I just wanted to make that comment that once you get uh, familiar, and I'm only scratching the surface, really. I, I believe that uh, deeper understanding of mix effect can really create efficient use of ATEM. So I know more about mix effect than I know about the ATEM. Okay, go ahead. Um, next question. Yeah, we're suddenly swamped here. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh. Adam, what other irons do you have in the fire besides the wonderful work you're doing to advance mix effect? Our show and community have come to rely on your software. What future collaborations would you be interested in? Yeah, so this is kind of like the, the main thing I'm focusing on. I think I want to create these kind of ancillary products around MixFX. So the kind of like the Tally, the kind of the Fotem, um, maybe MixFX server if I have time. So those are the kind of like the two that I'm actively looking into working on. And originally, I was going to do like a teleprompter app because I have a need for that. But uh, there's some exciting new developments and kind of like in more of the kind of like a web software another person's working on that I think is going to be pretty, pretty cool when he actually announces it. So no more, no more teleprompter app from me, but maybe like Tally app and uh, a Fotem simulator. And next question. Has Gajar in Cape Town mix effect companion profile. I purchased this, but have not implemented it yet. Which version companion should I install for compatibility with the profile package? The current version, which I think what two point two or 2.3 will work fine with that. And then they have a, another upcoming release that will work fine as well. Um, it, again, it, as I said before, it doesn't support the ATEM SDI models yet, but uh, when I do update the modules, you'll have to get the beta companion releases. The next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania says, can you talk about MixFX Lab? What was the impetus to create this? Yeah, so I wanted a, a one place community for kind of learning about MixFX. So MixFX Labs has uh, like a dedicated Discord um, for users. There's a university which basically goes beyond the documentation and learning how to use MixFX. It's a way for me also to create a recurring revenue base. So right now, as you know, MixFX is a one time purchase. Um, and once you buy it, you have MixFX for, for forever. Uh, and while that works, you know, that works for you, it doesn't work necessarily for the software developer who kind of needs kind of like ongoing revenue to kind of survive. So the membership program with MixFact Labs is designed to do just that. And so I've given, trying to give kind of like bonuses in addition to the university, I'm going to be hosting office hours. You get access to the betas of MixFX. So if you wanted to test out iPadOS 16 version of MixFX, you could do so and run it in the background. So it's a way for me to, um, create that kind of recurring revenue base, but also give back to the MixFX community. And hopefully the MixFX community will get something out of becoming a member as well. Our next question. David Brady in New York City. Did I hear correctly that the an iPad Touch can be used as a server? From there, is it possible to use older gen iPads as the control service? You could. I mean, MixFX right now supports iOS 14. I might be bumping it up to iOS 15. Um, in the future, 
which will limit kind of the number of devices that can use it. Um, you do need a relatively newer iPad or iPod Touch uh, to run MixFX kind of quickly. As a server though, the iPod Touch 7th generation, which they don't make anymore, uh, you can find that one for, for cheap. That one runs fine as a server. You just kind of like plug it in and then turn on OSC and then you can just control it through companion uh, while still using an iPad as your primary control surface. Next question. And David Brady is tagging on this one. And to tack onto the iPad Touch, can setup and or config be done on an iPad and exported to, exported to the smaller iPod device? So there are some things that are exported automatically. So if you use the same iCloud account, you'll get things like all your switcher connections, all your streaming services, all your super source layouts, all that stuff should sync back and forth between uh, devices. Um, you would have to configure things like uh, the OSC ports and your automations, like enabling all the automations individually on each uh, device. And I think the last question for the hour. Kyle Hammond gets the honor from Chicago, Illinois. You showed multiple streaming services. Does MixEffect let you stream to these multiple services at the same time? It does not. So it's streaming through the ATEM. So whatever the ATEM is streaming to, that's what the... That's what you're streaming to. So if you're streaming to Restream, then you can figure out Restream, and that can stream to multiple services. Adam, thank you so much for your time. It's really, really great to have you back. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, uh, hopefully you'll be able to come back uh, relatively often. <laughs> I, I know it's busy. It's hard. You, you just get these little windows. But, uh, but next time you have an update, please, uh, please come back and, and talk to us more. Definitely. Hopefully not in, in another year, but sooner than that. Yeah, yeah, me too. Oh, well, definitely. Hopefully, hopefully, have you. The the doors open. Give us a couple of weeks of warning, and we'll have you anytime. You know, we we love we really love the product. Um, and uh, thanks to our producers for all the great questions, uh, moving this thing forward. Thanks to our uh, panelists. We can't do this without you. And uh, thanks to the great crew in the back end, making all of this happen. Uh, just really, uh, really a pleasure. All right, now let's go ahead and jump into after hours. I, sp I just want to spend the whole day using Mix Effect. Like, what can I do? Oh, what a rabbit trail. Oh, fun. Yeah. I want to make the sound effect. Yeah, there you go. Get, yeah, Courtney. Get, get Courtney. And we should give tutorials in after hours. But, oh, Ken. Ken is going to be doing web tutorials. Ken. No, is... but we have a separate after effect Mix Effects tutorial another day. Yes, we should. We should. Ken's doing web today. Just in case you're wondering. Just to remind you. I know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>